sir. Good, man. How are you? Good, good. Um, how did you decide to produce this story and what was and what first attracted you to this story? Yeah, back, I mean, like a lot of people back in 2006, when it became this national story, I, I first saw it on uh, College Game Day. They did a whole piece on it. And I just remember watching it and being really moved and, and emotional just from a three or four minute clip. Uh, really heartwarming. And just to think of what Ray, you know, was stepping up and doing uh, was amazing. So I felt like, you know, maybe this could be a movie. You know, I think, you know, you're always as a producer on the lookout for great stories and you got to act really quickly. So I was able to contact the school and then get in touch with Ray. And, you know, there were a lot of people at that point, it was pretty overwhelming for him, you know, dealing with all this and then, you know, people from Hollywood calling, but uh, you know, we really hit it off and I ended up getting the rights and, uh, Set it up at another studio really quickly. Uh, it didn't happen at Disney at the time. And, uh, you know, we developed and got a really good screenplay, but the movie never happened. It came close a couple times. And then, you know, over the next, you know, 12, 13 years, just always kept in touch with Ray and always said, you know, hey, listen, I, 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 I love the script. I love this project. I'm never going to leave it. And, uh, you know, I, he, he reminds me that I told him, I don't even remember this, that, you know, whether it takes a year, five, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, it could take that long to get made. And I think it would ended up being 14 years uh, from the time I met him to, to you know, uh, when Disney Plus announced their um, their platform a couple of years ago, that's when I brought it back over to my former home and uh, where I made a lot of movies and, you know, just was a perfect fit. Now you touched on it a little bit. What happened with the, the different studio and then why was it switched over to Disney Plus? Well, you know, there's uh, w whatever studio, you know, lots of studios, all of them have many, many, you know, movies in development and only a few get made. I mean, these are, these are, you know, multi-million dollar investments and, you know, not that they don't like them for whatever reason, they just, you know, don't come together. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I think a small percentage, it might be eight, 10% of the movies in development that even get made. So for no reason of the movie, just, you know, the timing and just couldn't, you know, just never came together and, so you always got to just wait for that right, you know, uh, that right home at the right time. And then um, a lot of people were um, contacting Ray Ray, um, trying to get um, his story pitch. Um, how did you convince him to go with you guys? You know, I think at the time, you know, I had only done a couple movies, but I had done The Rookie, Miracle, and I just finished Invincible football movie. And you know, I just talked to him about, you know, how I saw it. I, I was pretty honest with him. You know, I, I was a former athlete. You know, I played at University of Maryland. I, I pitched there and, you know, played at Clemson. And, you know, uh, I just was familiar with sports. You know, I think he felt like there was an authenticity maybe with me and a comfort. So I think with anything, it's, you know, you kind of go with your gut. So it just really kind of we hit it off. Can you tell me about that first meeting that you had with Ray Ray? I, I just remember it was over the phone, you know, we had to go through the school and then, you know, got contact information and, and uh, it was a long time ago, but I just remember talking to him and told him who I was and, and told him how amazed I was at his story and just said, I, I, I'll always be honest with you and I'll always work my hardest. And, and uh, you know, I think at the end of a, it was probably about a 10 minute call, you know, he just said he'd get back to me. And then, uh, you know, I think a couple of days later, he, you know, I got word back that, you know, we we're going to get the rights. It seems like you worked closely with you on the film. Um, what did it mean to you and the actors to have them there on the set, um, seemingly every step of the way? Yeah, it, it was great. I mean, you know, so, so some people have done movies about don't want to be around. They don't want to, you know, it just depends on who you are. The great thing is that, you know, we really leaned on Ray. I mean, he helped train our actors. Um, he lived in Atlanta, and that's where we shot. We shot at Clemson and then finished up the film in Atlanta where he lived. So he was in both places. We encouraged it and he, you know, he really enjoyed it. He enjoyed coming around with his son and, and his brother and, you know, mom, they were, they were just a part of the movie. They were always there and we really appreciate it. And it's nice to be able to turn to someone and go, Hey, Ray, what, you know, what were you thinking here? What do you think about this? Uh, so I think he really enjoyed the process. I think it's really can be overwhelming and, and, you know, surreal. And those are the words certainly that he's using now uh, at this point, because it does almost, you know, you develop, it over the years and you're, you're always working on a screenplay and then, you know, you're reading a screenplay and maybe you have input, but until the movie then starts to go and then gets made, and then there's that wave of the movie getting made. And then it, you, you kind of go away for six months to a year as the movie's being built and post and edited. And, uh, and then you don't really think about it for a while. And then when you see that first cut 
it's it can be overwhelming and uh it's really satisfying for me that's the favorite uh part of what i do is when when you know you have a good movie you end up showing it to the people that it's about and uh you watch their reaction uh, what was the process of finding and casting jay and once you saw him how did you know that was the right right person for ray ray the, you know this was more of a discovery so we read hundreds if not thousands of, of kids you know i mean those those start really really deep you know you get people to put themselves on tape you know you do auditions you know the people it started with disney casting that's who started it off until you know we got our casting director on board so we we just looked through tons and tons and you know they would put the kind of best auditions but you're still looking at you know 50 auditions and i remember our office you know we we got we got our first big batch that had a lot of readings on it and uh, strangely, we, we chose Jay and Thaddeus. Those were the two favorites in our office of, of these actors. We knew it was probably not going to happen, but like just at the time from what we saw, these were the two we liked the best. And the two of these kids made it to kind of the finals where we brought four or five actors in for these kind of chemistry reads where you're just rotating out, you know, the, the Ray character and the Jay character and seeing, you know, who works the best. And I just remember when, the, when, when Jay and uh, TJ were in the room together. And I, I remember taking a picture and, and I just was like, oh man, hold my breath. Cause I really was rooting for these two to, to get it. And Reggie, you know, Hudlin, our director and casting, we all felt, man, these, these are the two. So to kind of start from the, uh, you know, big pile and, and having your favorites and, you know, them be, being cast is pretty amazing. We got it right for sure. Uh, what did Jay Reeves bring to this role? You know, um, first of all, he was athletic, you know, he kind of resembled Ray, but he had this kind of heart and, and he's a really good actor. I mean, I think a lot, listen, if you get to the point where you're like the last four or five being called back, you're all really good actors. Then it's about something that you feel. All right. It's something that, you know, as a producer or, you know, a casting director or a director or studio executive, those are the four kind of, you know, points of views when you're, when you're casting you know, it's, it's just something you feel and you end up agreeing on. And, and, you know, a lot of times with actors, you, you do come to agree on, on who the choice is. You might, you might have differing opinions, but you know, you might come around to a certain choice, but I think it felt, you know, really unanimous that we had the right two people. And, and I think Jay was just amazing, you know. Um, how did director regional get involved? Um, you know, once, once, you know, again, the, most of what I do is work on screenplays, you know, for every movie I've done, there's, there's years of work behind it, you know, and, uh, you know, we had, uh, you know, Nick Santoro had, had wrote the original screenplay and then wrote some more on it. And then we brought in Randy McKinnon, who did a fantastic job with some of the details of the movie. He had played football at, at Syracuse, was about the same age as Ray. They knew some of the same people. So they really hit it off. And, and, and again, it's just trying to get layers and, and, and moments and nuance into a film. So once we got, once the studio felt like the script was at a good enough place, you know, then, then that's the next step. And, and usually once you get a director on board, you got a pretty good chance of making the film. So when we brought Reggie on, we continued to work on, on the screenplay. And, uh, and then, you know, we kind of got our green light, you know, they have you budget the movie and, figure out the cost of it. And then, you know, they usually tell you, okay, here's what you're going to make the movie for. You show us where you're going to make it and how you're going to accomplish that. And then you get your green light and you go and cast it. You've done a lot of other sport movies. Um, and personally, I like the million dollar arm the best. Um, and I thought it was absolutely terrific. Thank you. Um, yeah. You're welcome, sir. What were some of your biggest challenges um, in doing a football theme movie? You know, the uh, biggest challenges are like, you know, you got, you got probably a hundred players, you know, you've got a cast guys, it's uniforms. It's just massive. You know, it's basketball. You got, you know, maybe 15 guys, baseball, there's, there's, there's less guys, you know, baseball's challenging as well, but, uh, and you can see you know, the faces uh, of the people in baseball, it's harder to double. The good thing about football is you can double a lot of the, the guys. Now we had our actors do a lot. So there weren't a lot of doubles except for some of the bigger hits that you don't want to have your actors, you know uh, you know, maybe have an issue with. So, um, uh, yeah, football is just, it's just a, a lot of guys. It's a lot of manpower to kind of organize and, you know, get everybody in the right place and, and, uh, you know, pull it off. It's, it's, they're just big productions. Now you had a film during the halftime of an actual Clemson game. What was that experience like? Um, does that make it more stressful having all those people watching you and were you able to feed off of that energy 
And did you have to film um, that multiple? Just one half time or multiple half times? No, we, we got we got one half time. We had about nine or ten minutes and stressful. What's the next level above that? <laughs> but with with that stress comes like just a feeling of, I mean, we were all overwhelmed. It, it, we didn't know what to expect at halftime because it was it was against uh, UNC Charlotte. We ch- purposely chose a game that wouldn't be as intense. You know, there's very little room in Clemson's small school, but when people come in on game day, you don't have a square inch available. So we felt like, you know, we were going to pick that game. It worked perfectly in our schedule and because we started on campus and you just hope for the best. It was our, we had shot that whole week leading into it and uh, a week and a half leading into it. So it ended on that game day and we got, I mean, we, it was months of preparation. You had, everyone had to hit a mark and you couldn't have two takes. So we spent so much time practicing that, you know, from prepping the movie once we got our team and it was relentless. So once it's game day, it's, you know, listen, I pitched, I pitched in the big leagues and you know, that feeling of getting ready for a big game, same thing. I mean, you once you're there, you're just like, okay, we've prepared for it. It's going to happen. I mean, I was up in the booth with, with the PA announcer and I was kind of feeding him lines, you know, and, and making sure that, that he said it in, at the right time and the right place. And, and making sure and looking down at 85,000 people, the, the, the actors that were down there, it, it was surreal. I mean, it was, it was so loud. They said it was the third loudest they'd ever heard that stadium. They were like, you know, once against Florida state, once against Notre Dame, and then this one. And it was, <laughs> we didn't know if, because you can leave at halftime, they let you leave and come back and you can go and tailgate and then come back. And a game like that, that's kind of a little out of reach. You, you don't even know if people are coming back, but we had promoted and everyone in the community and, and just everyone at the school and the local news media, they really put the word out. So when right went before halftime, you started hearing the crowd just go nuts. And our guys were starting to assemble up on Howard Rock. And, and now the team is down here. It's still before halftime. And you hear this noise, but they're not cheering for the action. They're cheering for the guys because they know a movie's happening. And it was just like everyone fed off of that. And everyone just started going crazy. When the Clemson team, because we started our, they had, we had to get the Clemson team off. And I remember Dabo being interviewed, you know, at halftime. And he's, it got so loud, he couldn't even hear. And the, and the, and the woman, you know, interviewing him was like, hey, you know, by the way, you got this, this movie. Are you aware? Are, are you going to be in it? And he was just like, it was so loud, he couldn't hear. And he starts laughing. He's like, I, I, and he just stops and he's looking and he's laughing. And then he's like, hey, listen, you know. I'm in the movie. You're in the movie. We're all here in the movie. And then he just starts <laughs> laughing again, looking because it's got so loud in there. It was like you couldn't even hear yourself. So once we did the whole thing and they, I mean, you got to see it on film. You can see little clips of it. And it's like it's hard to kind of reproduce that. So we had those 10 minutes and man, the crowd was such a part of this film. Uh, I'll never experience anything like that again. What do you want um, the moviegoers to experience with this film? You know, I, I, I kind of feel like uh, Boy, Ray, what, what an example, you know, of, of what he did for his brother. You know, it's a small story as far as like, it's a personal story. It's just two brothers, you know, it's one brother stepping up for another and putting his own future at risk. You know, he didn't know if he could handle both, you know, playing, uh, you know, they had to deal with the NCAA. It became a big kind of national story. And he's just trying to hold it together and, and be a father and a brother and, and a student athlete and, uh, and everything. And it's a lot of pressure. So, uh, you know, I feel like people do, just can, can be inspired by it, inspired for these, these seemingly small stories that can have a big impact. Um, last question, um, if you don't mind, how did a former Major League Baseball player become a producer in Hollywood? And what would you say to those that have goals of producing movies? Oh, you know, I didn't set out to be a movie producer. I, you know, I lived in uh, Los Angeles in the off season when I was playing, so uh, over the years, you know, just friends of mine, you know, uh, were in the film business. So it just happened like I knew an agent, I knew a writer, I knew a director, and there was kind of a big group of us. And, you know, I was kind of on the outside of, of this group, and uh, they were all in the film business. So I did, it was kind of second nature. When they'd huddle up and start talking movies, I would, I would kind of pop out and, you know, just tune out a little bit. And then, you know, I wanted to move back to California. And I, I, you know, I had done some other things after baseball, after I retired. And I'm like, you know, what can I do? And, uh, you know, everyone was in the movie business. So I said, you know, maybe, maybe I'll try this. And uh, that was it. Just tried it. Worked out of a garage and, uh, you know, just self-taught. Didn't know anything, but I knew people, which was a big plus. 
and people were gracious and, and helpful to me. But if I didn't find good good stories, I don't think it would have gone anywhere. And you know, the big break that I had was you know the rookie, and and that was our first film. Um, you know, I I found that story in 1999. I'm reading Sports Illustrated at the doctor's office, and I'm, I came upon this little article, and I'm and I'm reading about this teacher who's 35 who the story of how his kids, you know, they had this challenge and they won this and he had to try out and, and I'm reading it and I'm like, this guy's in triple a uh, step away from the big leagues. And then I, at the end of the article, it said he had played a little bit of minor league baseball and signed in 1983 with the Brewers. And I'm like, that's when I signed. And I looked at the name. I didn't even look, I didn't even, the name didn't register. And, and I said, Jim Morris. I'm like, Oh my God, I played with him for three years. We roomed together one spring training. You know, you're like brothers with all these guys. You know, I actually got my start in rookie ball because he got hurt. And I got a spot starting through a shutout and I was never out of starting rotation after that. So, I mean, I was a 15th round pick, you know, barely, you know, made the team and, and uh, ended up getting up to the big leagues. And, you know, I played with Jim a lot. And, you know, when, when you finish with ball and you kind of move away, it's funny because, you know, you don't keep in touch with these guys a lot of times. But boy, if you, if you see him again, you pick it up right where you left off. And when I read that, I was just like, oh, my God, I got to get this story. And, uh, you know, long story short, it was really, really competitive because I I'd, gotten to it first and no one even knew about it at that time and we were about to secure the rights for disney and over the weekend you know i mean this is a long story but you know jim's agent uh he had just gotten an agent this attorney and he was going out of town and he said listen let me know for i'm, I'm leaving friday morning and i'm not going to have cell service but you know and we thought we would know from disney whether they wanted to buy it friday morning friday morning comes around we can't get a hold of the uh the agent the attorney and he said, I'm going skiing. I'll be back Tuesday morning. We'll talk then. Well, all hell broke loose because over the weekend, Jim gets called up to the big leagues. And that it's not even that that was the big deal. The problem was that, and I know Bill Plasky is a friend now. We're actually I'm adapting a, a book that he's writing right now. But so Bill Plasky, Tuesday morning, we wake up. We have this call set, you know, on this little movie that we're going to now that no one knows about. And we open up the LA Times and on the front page is a story full bleak. The whole front of the sports page is about Jim Morris because they went from playing in Texas to come and play in the angels. And Pulaski had written this incredible three page article on Jim Moore. So the whole town read it and went after it. And uh, you know, I'm in a garage going like, Oh my God, who am I competing with? We heard Spielberg got it. We heard this person got it. like, everyone was trying to get it literally. And, uh, and five days later, you know, we ended up, I ended up getting the rights, you know, I reconnected with Jim and you know, he came up to Disney and we had to really sweat it out, but, but that was the big break. You know, I mean, it was like, had that movie not happened, I don't know what my career would have been or how what what path it would have taken, but that set us uh, set me on this course of 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 you know finding and 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 doing these great iconics, some small, some big, you know, like Miracle and Secretariat, but then some small like you know Invincible or Million Dollar Arm or McFarland. It, it doesn't matter the size or how much people know about it. It just has to be inspiring. So, yeah, it was a uh, you know you just got to work hard. I mean, the advice, I was 34 when I started, 35 with no experience. So, you know, if somebody wants to follow that path, you know, you can do it. And, uh, you know, I make movies about underdog stories. So, yeah, it's fun. Mike, I really appreciate you um, making these these movies. As you know, sports is a platform to change lives. And sports and movies, um, they kind of bring people together. Um, and then when they see other people overcoming obstacles, um, it feels like they can overcome obstacles as well. So I just want to say I appreciate you making these type of movies, and hopefully we see more of these sport movies um, and underdog movies in the future from you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Donnie. You're welcome. Have